generation, with the passage of the survivor generation, but the trauma passes on to the children and grandchildren and generation and generation and is compounded by the ex post facto crime of denial which allows no healing of the great wound that is inflicted. Almost all of us here, with few exceptions of the young children that are happily, I see, present, are 20th century people. Our century was the wonderful and most wonderful and wondrous century of all time. I was born on a small farm in California. I experienced running water coming into the house. I experienced the first telephone. I experienced the first television. I experienced later on in my life something that was amazing, a letter from Australia that I received on the very same day, and it was called a fax. And then the fax became obsolete and were into emails and blueberries and blackberries and I don't know what other kind of berries of the great age of technology. But our century also created the means and technology for mass destruction. When we say that the Armenian genocide was the first major genocide of the 20th century, it's the genocide that used the technology because even in backward Turkey, the telegraph was operating and Talat Pasha, the Minister of Interior, could keep tabs on the deportation caravans and the cleansing process. So we're here for reaffirmation. Someone asked me, why doesn't the world recognize? And I say, the world has recognized many times over. And we're here now to seek reaffirmation of what the world recognized and then chose to submit itself to amnesia because it did not fulfill its pledges and promises and therefore found it easier to forget. And when it did not forget, to allow itself to be subjected to bullying and blackmail, the strongest country in the world. Let's say this to ourselves. Let us not stop, as we always frequently do, talking about one and a half million people. One and a half million people means very little in a culture that is used to the deaths of millions of people. The 20th century saw the loss of more than 100 million innocent people. So let us not stop with that. What we need to do is what Rafi Hovhannisian found the term and for which he was criticized by a couple of California newspaper editors when he talked about national dispossession. That is the crime which we are subjected to and continue to feel not only the death of our forefathers, of our parents and our grandparents, but the loss of a civilization, the loss of a homeland, the loss of a way of life of 3,000 years is the major continuing traumatic aspect of 1915. And so it is our challenge and the challenge of the young people I see here, who will be tomorrow's historians and politicians, to make the Armenian genocide not only an Armenian experience, but it has to become a universal experience, an experience of humanity. It must be integrated into the history of mankind. If we are unable to make this crime a part of human history, it will be lost and it will truly be forgotten. And so the challenge is to make it a part of human. Make 
Garevor Mas. Armenian history, and I will be brief, the Armenian genocide was a prototype of 20th century genocide. It was not just something that happened and finished. But if we know it, the legacy of the genocide continued on until nearly every other genocide of the 20th century. The equating of party and state becoming one. The use of scapegoating. The use of secrecy and denial even as the event is taking place. The use of paramilitary forces and extra-military forces. I mean, you know, if you study the Holocaust, we hear about Einsatzgruppen, special groups sent to Russia to wipe out the, the Jewish population of Russia. But don't forget it started with the Teshkilati Masusa, the special organization that was organized by the Young Turk Central Committee to go out and to bring out the criminals and the tribesmen to prepare the ambushes to destroy the Armenian people. And the incentives to kill every genocide of the 20th century has had a huge transfer of economic wealth from one group to another group. And it happened. It happened in Armenia. It happened during the Holocaust. It happened in Cambodia. It happened in the Balkans. It happened in Rwanda as a huge transfer of wealth from one to another. And denial is not and it is not an exception. Denial is the rule. The Holocaust is the exception, not the other genocides of the 20th century, because only in Germany's case was there absolute admission for and all others. And so there's much to be learned in comparative perspective with the Armenian genocide. And so we call upon this government and all governments of power to understand that they dropped the ball and they failed in their obligation and that they should not continue to subject themselves to amnesia because the truth of the matter is that much of the turmoil in the Middle East and the continuous flight of the Christian population out of the Middle East has its roots in this very period of non-fulfillment of pledges. Let me conclude. The 1982, for the first time there was to be a international conference in Israel, not only on the Holocaust, but on Holocaust and genocides. And at that time I was active in the Armenian Assembly and was perhaps instrumental in getting seven or eight scholars of the Armenian genocide, both Armenian and non-Armenian, to submit proposals to participate in the Tel Aviv conference in 1982. As soon as that was announced, the Turkish government pulled out all the stops of pressure, blackmail, and bullying that caused the Israeli government to pull out of the conference, that called, caused Yad Vashem to pull out of the conference, to cause Tel Aviv University to pull out of the conference, but did not force the organizers, Jewish organizers, who were dedicated to it, to pull out. And they continued. They crippled the conference, but they didn't paralyze it entirely. And the Jewish scholars present were livid and angry that they, as a victim people, should now be put in a place to victimize others, the Armenians. And as a result of that, as a result of that conference, uh, my first book, I published on the Armenian Genocide. I'm not a genocide scholar. I've never studied genocide. It's not a pleasant subject. And I was forced into this field by denial. Denial of all those people that we see before us that they are liars, that they did not go through what we know they went through. But what I want to say is I finally, for the first of five books that I've published on the Armenian Genocide, 
was titled The Armenian Genocide in Perspective. And I had a member of the U.S. Holocaust Council, Terence Dupre, who was not Jewish but a member of the, of the Holocaust Council, write the introduction. I'd like to conclude with some words that Terence Dupre used in that introduction. He says, national catastrophes can be survived if, and perhaps only if, those to whom disaster happens can recover themselves through knowing the truth of their suffering. Great powers, on the other hand, would vanquish not only the peoples they subjugate, but also the cultural mechanisms that would sustain vital memory of historical crimes. When modern nation states make way for geopolitical power plays, they are not removing everything, nations, cultures, homelands in their path. Great powers regularly demolish others' people's claims to dignity and place, and sometimes, as we know, the outcome is genocide. Against historical crimes, we fight as best we can, and a cardinal part of this engagement is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And we have gathered to demonstrate that we are continuing the struggle of memory against forgetting as we recommit ourselves annually and semi-annually and what in my not daily to the memory that will continue until there is victory. And let me conclude by my five H's, my five H's. Ishenk, Harkink, Haradevink, Hachtanagink, Yev Hachtanagink. Shrug out,